on part two of how can you handle your sufferings like Jesus. Last week we saw that Christ focused on others people's suffering in the midst of his suffering. He was more concerned with other people's suffering. Today we see that one of the ways in which we handle suffering is you follow God's plan. There is a purpose in the suffering, God has a plan in the suffering, and God has a goal to achieve for you through the suffering that you're facing. As we see with Christ, we see that Christ follows God's plan of forgiveness. We see that Christ follows God's plan of endurance. And we see that Christ follows God's plan of extending grace in the midst of the suffering of the cross, of the weight of all the sins of the world upon His shoulders. In the midst of ridicule and physical torture, Christ follows God's plan for him in all these things. And I would suggest that when we go through suffering, we need to stick to the plan as well. To God's perfect plan. There was... Uh, I did some research. I don't think this battle quite went that way, but there was a movie that was made about Julius Caesar conquering Gaul. A little gruesome. Um, and the Gallic general, Austin Generix, or something to that effect. And anyways, this, the Gallic king was trapped inside a city. And so there's fortifications around it. And Julius Caesar comes and lays siege to the city. And Julius Caesar not only throws up siege works against the city, he builds another line of defense around because the Gallic relief army is coming to relieve the king. Now, in the movie, from what I understand, this isn't necessarily true to history, but from the movie, the, the king didn't want the guys on the outside to attack because he knew the Romans were sandwiched. And he's like, well, why don't we just do to the Romans what they're trying to do to me? We'll starve them out. But the Gauls, being the Gauls and hungry for victory and power, decided that they would attack. And the Romans ended up slaughtering them all, even though they really outnumbered the Romans. And Julius Caesar wins a great victory because what? They couldn't stick to the plan. Now, we know that from humanly speaking, that as humans, we come up with plans that are always going to be subject to contingencies. Why? Because we're man and we don't know all the possible outcomes, right? But God knows all the possible outcomes. He knows the purpose. So there is never a good reason to depart from the plan that God has laid out for, for us. And so, let's look at this first part of God's plan, and that is of forgiveness. So, Jesus, is, he's been so weak, remember, that someone else has to carry his cross. He's probably staggering through the streets because he has been so severely beaten, perhaps beyond the, the ability to even recognize, and then to add insult to injury in 32, to others who were criminals. I mean, the text makes this very clear, that the two guys that Jesus was with were guilty. Uh, we don't know exactly what they're guilty of, but it probably had to be some heinous crime, and certainly some heinous crime against Rome, because just mere thievery or thuggery wouldn't, would not mean the, the type of punishment of a cross. That was reserved for the worst. All right? And so what they're going through is probably somehow it has to do with even rebellion against Rome. There are some people who speculate that these were Barabbas' buddies. They were part of an insurrection where they murdered people. We don't know for sure, but again, what they did had to have been extreme. Otherwise, they wouldn't be on the cross. And the text says they were guilty, were led away to be put to death with him. So Christ, who is innocent, is now being identified with the guilty, which is really the whole point of the cross, right? That Christ is being identified with you and me who are guilty before God. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. So they come here, and that's when they nail Jesus. Think about that. They nail him to the cross. 
I would think that'd be an extraordinarily painful circumstance upon what already he is. And so he's there pushing himself up and down to get a breath. And basically, in crucif crucifixion, you die of suffocation. You just finally get to the point where you can't push yourself up anymore and you just suffocate. And that could take days and days and days. Just a really slow, awful death. And so they now do this to Christ. And notice Jesus' response. He says, And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He has been he has been taken through a kangaroo court. He has been charged unjustly. They have brought false witnesses against him to lie. And then they have done all this to him. And Jesus says... I forgive. And not only does Jesus say, I forgive, he knows and see what happens next. Because this is a hard part, I think, when we have forgiveness. We say, well, if I forgive them, what if they don't change? Well, as we're going to see next, that and the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him. So the very people, the rulers and the soldiers, whom he forgave for what they did, and they hear him say that he forgave them, had no effect on them in that moment. And yet, he still forgives. Jesus, who we know, says, hey, I could have a legion of angels here right now, and we could just be done. But that wasn't God's perfect plan to bring salvation to mankind, was it? And here's the thing. If Jesus can forgive in that instance... That says a couple things, as we said last week. I think, one, it speaks to the fact that he's God. Because I don't know, I don't think that what Jesus did on the cross is humanly possible. And as humans, the only time humans are able to forgive in this manner is when God is with them. When God grants them the ability to forgive. Which is one of the things that when we are having a hard time to forgiving, we need to pray about it. And we need to ask God for the superhuman strength that he gives in order to forgive. And that the other great news about this is it shows us this. How, do I, how can I be confident that Jesus really forgives? That God would really forgive me for all the sins and horrible things I've done, how I've made a mockery of his name and not followed him and committed all these sins. How do I know that Jesus would forgive me? Well, if Jesus could forgive these guys on the cross, I bet he can forgive you. Because that was the whole point, was to bring God's forgiveness to mankind. And we see some incredible things about Jesus. We've got to remember that Jesus came to forgive and deliver people from slavery. And if we look at Ephesians 6.12, real briefly... So Ephesians 6.12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers, or this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Uh, the irony there is we covered this verse in Sunday school. See, Jesus understood it wasn't about the people. They were captive to an enemy. And that's one of the things we need to always remember. That Satan has taken people captives and he've made, he's made them slaves. In fact, it's the worst kind of slavery because it's the slavery of the mind. They believe they're free. They believe they're doing right. In fact, the Apostle Paul said, I thought I was serving God when I was murdering Christians. You realize that these Muslims in Muslim countries, they think they're serving God when they persecute Christians. They think that's what God wants from them. They are deceived. The reality of it is, see, God has put us there. there. The goal is to win them to Christ. Jesus died so that people who are deceived by Satan and are his possessions would no longer be Satan's possession. 
that Jesus' blood would purchase them from the enemy, that they would become part of his kingdom and they would be delivered. So that's going to cause a problem if you wander around all day hating people that Jesus died for that he wants to deliver from their slavery. That's going to cause a problem in reaching them, isn't it? And so we need to follow the example of Christ. So sometimes, as we talked about the different kinds of suffering last time, there is suffering, right, that just happens to us, right? Physical suffering that we all experience, sickness, pain, those things. There's suffering that happens because a loved one dies, right? There's loss. But then there's also the kind of suffering in particular that Christ is suffering from, which is unjust and unfair, And Jesus says when we go through that suffering, we are to forgive. And the reality of it is while many of us do suffer unjustly and unfair, and, and particularly even for Christ, because we're human, we sometimes tend to think we suffer more unjustly or unfairly than we do. For example, the marriage relationship. Now it is true that your spouse probably sometimes doesn't treat you the way you should or unfair. But if we're also honest, we don't always treat them right either. And we tend to think that their mistreatment of us, the suffering that we experience because they don't treat us right, is worse than the suffering that they experience because we don't treat them right. Well, you've missed the whole point, haven't you? As Jesus calls us to forgive, even if it's true that you're suffering worse, that's not really the point. I mean, because has any of us suffered like this? And can any of us really suffer like this? Because does any of, you know, by God's grace, none of us will know what it's like to carry the weight of the sins of the entire world or to know what it's like to have had a perfect relationship from God and then have it severed, right? We were born alienated from God. So we know what that's like, but Christ who had a perfect relationship with the Father from the beginning, to have that separated in this moment. But see, Jesus knows something. Despite the feelings of even being forsaken by God, He knows that what's coming. He knows the end of the plan. He knows there's a purpose. He knows He's, he's there to bring salvation and to steal the spoils from Satan, which is the souls of humans lives and so he's going to stick to that plan and he's going to bring that about and he remembers that God's goal is to bring forgiveness and that's why we need to understand it's God's plan for you to forgive those whose sin causes you to suffer that's God's plan <laughs> If you're suffering because of other people's sin, God's plan for you is for you to forgive them whether or not they think they've done anything wrong or whether or not they, quite frankly, would care two hoots whether or not you forgive them. That's God's plan. And we need to understand this just as a church body. A church without grace is a church that is shrinking. In other words, a church where we are not actively forgiving each other, whether because we've sinned against each other or just because, I mean, I have to teach this to my kids. Sometimes we'll say, hey, you should say sorry. And they're like, well, I didn't do it on purpose. Yeah, I know you didn't do it on purpose, but you still bump, bumped your sibling and knocked them down. You know, nobody said you did it on purpose, but you could say, hey, I didn't mean to do it. I know the old adage is, I didn't mean to do it, but I'm not sorry I did. You've know, you got you to gotta be careful of that. Right? We need to offer and extend grace. And you know, the beauty of Christ when He forgives on the cross is this. Christ never asks you or me to do something He's not willing to do. Because if we were to go back to Matthew 6.15, what does Jesus say? He says, if you don't forgive people, their trespasses, God won't forgive you. I mean, that is pretty intense stuff. You know, forgiveness is not an option. It's just, it's a mark of being a follower of Christ. Even when we suffer, and we can see then from Matthew 23 that we're to get it done today. Hey, 
You bring your gift before to, to the offering. You bring your offering and you realize there's an issue between you and your brother. Leave your offering and go take care of it. So essentially, to put it another way, Jesus is saying, hey, if you're here today in Bumpville and you need to, somebody has asked you for forgiveness and you haven't forgiven them, you need to leave right now. You need to literally get up, walk out of this church and go make that right. God would be more pleased with that than if you stayed for the service. And that is incredible. And so we see again, and the amazing thing, as I said, is that Jesus, Jesus does this, I think, knowing, and we certainly see that the people he extends forgiveness to want nothing to do with his forgiveness. And that moves us into the next part of God's plan, and that is God's plan that we deal with our suffering by following God's plan of endurance, right? And this is true, and I think this is applicable whether or not, whether or not we're suffering because other people have done something to us. This is true in all kinds of suffering. Those of you who have had cancer or have been sick for a long time, struggle with pain or the loss of a loved one, you know, hey, I mean, it goes on for days and days, weeks, months, years, and I'm struggling. And so what does that mean? It means endurance. You know, every day you have to go back to it. You have to go back to work, trusting in God, enduring the pain, enduring the suffering, and trusting God with the issue new every morning. Because every morning it's a fight to believe that God really has what's best in this for me and He's refining me. Endurance. So we see, so Jesus on the cross, 35, and the people stood by watching. So that's interesting. So you got Jesus on the cross, and so you got the people over here, but the rulers. How many nations have suffered not so much for the actions of their people because of the incompetent stubbornness of their leadership? We in the United States can't really point fingers. Though I think we forget the people are the ones who tolerate their leaders. But notice the people are not mocking Christ. It is the rulers here that are mocking. Or I should say scoffing. So the rulers scoffed at him saying, He save others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. In other words, hey, if you're really God's son, well then why don't you come down off the cross and show us? We'll believe now and then. Jesus isn't that foolish. They might believe, but they won't believe. A rebel can believe that that's the king and his army, but that don't mean they're going to submit anytime soon. And here's the other thing. It wasn't part of the plan. God's plan was for Christ to endure on the cross. It wasn't to come off the cross. Because if he comes off the cross, then his blood doesn't pay. He doesn't finish the job. It's interesting, just so we can get a true sense of scoff here. Um, the Greek word, which I won't try to pronounce so you have your notes, means properly turn the nose out or up, sneer, scoff, figuratively, scornful, reject, blow someone off, like spelling mucus out of the nose. Essentially, that they're saying to Jesus is, to us, you're snot in our nose and we'll be glad to be rid of you. Just like so. <laughs> I know. I overkilled on that. But it needed to be done anyway, so it fit. <laughs> that is what they were saying to Christ. That is the depth of what was going on. They were, ex we don't want you, even though you forgave us, even what we did was pretty crooked and, crooked and backhanded. We are getting rid of you. Not only were these the na national leaders, these were the church leaders, in essence. And so we have to be careful too. We hear people say, well, but there's people who are corrupt in the church and not following God. Yeah, that's going to be the case. That doesn't give you an excuse to reject God. 
And so we continue down. The soldiers, so we got the rulers, but now we got the soldiers, who he's also forgiven, also mocked him coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, this is the king of the Jews. And of course, that's one of the neat, interesting things in scripture, some of the irony, right? They put the sign up saying king of the Jews, which was a mocking thing. He's not really the king of the Jews, but yet the irony is he really is the king of the Jews. Jews. But so the soldiers chime in now. And again, hey, come down. And see, God is above the pettiness of man. See, in officiating, you know, one of the adages in sports is this, right? The ref doesn't catch the first guy, but he catches the second guy. Right, so and so every time down the floor, he you know he turns to so and you know just talking trash to him, you know your mom is this blah blah blah, and then so and so finally gets sick of it, you know halfway through the game he turns around you know throws a haymaker at the guy and gets ejected, and what do we say? And then he'll say, well so and so said oh, I didn't hear what so and so said, and so and so knew that he wasn't going to get caught. He was just trying to egg the other guy on. It happened in the World Cup. Oh, it's been a few years. There's two guys walking down the field together. This guy says something. He pivots, boom, and headbutts the guy in the chest. Boom. Red card, he's done, his team loses. He's the best player on the field. He was taunted into making a mistake. And see, you cannot taunt God into leaving the plan and making a mistake. Because he's God. You're not going to do that. And if we continue, it gets interesting because now we got the criminals. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Now this is interesting. Um, so this word here is in the Greek is blasphemo, which you would get blasphemy. Okay, that we translate as railed, which I think is interesting. And it might help give a little bit more context to it. But the word means properly refuse to acknowledge good, worthy of respect, veneration, hence to blaspheme, which reverses moral value. So he is basically mockingly saying, Jesus, if you were really God, you would be able to save yourself and us, so why don't you do it? And what he's really saying is what? You can't. You think you're better than us. You think you're God. <laughs> you're here and you're dying with the rest of us. I mean, that is the attitude. Calling what is good. And this also points to this. Jesus is good. Jesus is holy. He is righteous. He is true. Is why what the thief says is blasphemous. Now, there are examples of this we see even in more modern history. I'll give you an example. So Benito Mussolini, you know who he is? You should, right? Italian dictator, what a real fascist is. So, before he became um, head of Italy, there's a story about him that goes like this. Um, I'm quoting from an article. In a debate with a cleric from the church, in 1903, Mussolini had boldly declared God to be dead. And as proof, took out his watch and gave him five minutes to strike him dead instead. The five minutes passed with no undue consequences for Mussolini, just terrible ones for the world, thus proving that it was God who was dead. I disagree with how that argu argu article ends. Think about this. You think, well, shoo. I mean, look at all the horrible things Mussolini did. I mean, why not God just strike him dead right there? See, Mussolini, and unfortunately, I think even the churchmen he was arguing against forgot one very important thing. God doesn't answer to Mussolini. And God doesn't answer to me either. I answer to God. And if anything, God not striking Mussolini de dead proves not only that God exists, but that it's the God that hung on the cross. Because the same Christ that refused to strike these people dead in that moment seems like the kind of God that would give Mussolini time to repent.
And hey, the truth of the matter is Mussolini got his wish. The people uprose, said, oh my goodness, you're killing this nation. Drug out, I think he was drugged through the streets either before or after he was killed. And then he did stand before the living holy God. And his situation was far worse. Because if God took him then, at least he didn't have to answer for all the crimes he committed after that point in time. So he just stored up more judgment for himself to judgment instead of taking advantage of God's mercy towards him. Because God can't be goaded or cowed into retaliating because God doesn't answer to man. We answer to him. And see, that's what it would have shown, right? If God had struck him dead, it would have shown that what? God answers to man. God can be provoked by man. Now, see, see, God's not the God that runs his mouth and has no fire behind it. God's the God that when taunted says nothing because he doesn't have to because <laughs> he's God. What does he got to worry about? He doesn't need to prove himself. He is because he's God. He's confident in who he is. Now, we need to understand this in Christianity as well. You know, unfortunately, some of you may have heard of the school in New York State that had the bomb threat this week um, over this particular book. I'll just read an excerpt from one article. It says, The threat specifically called out British author Juno Dawson. The book is, the, this is the title of the book, This Book is Gay. With the writer claiming this with the writer claiming the school district is grooming our children by allowing them to read books with LGBTQ things. And then this person did a bomb threat. Now last I knew, they still hadn't arrested anybody. So I think one thing that we always have to be careful is jumping to a conclusions and assuming that this was even put out there by somebody who actually is upset by the book. Listen. Mark's societyology is, I do something and blame somebody else for it. There's no reason that somebody in favor of this book didn't do this just to make the opposition look bad. I'm not saying that's what happened. I can't prove that. But until we know the facts, we just have to understand we live in that world. But even if it wasn't, what if it is somebody that's like, I don't think this book should be in schools, and I think it's grooming kids, which I would argue both those things are true. That book should not be in a school. I don't know if I'd say the school's necessarily grooming the kids, though it could be their agenda. It might not. You don't know without talking to them. But that's not how you'd respond. Once you, re I mean, really, you're so concerned about the kids, you threaten them, you threaten the school with a bomb? Like, what world are you from? That's just ridiculous. And put those kids through that trauma and all that tension. And then you give the enemies of God place to blaspheme because they say, see, all Christians who think this way, you guys are all terrorists and they spread this nonsense that, see, we have a right to do these things because we didn't, you, don't, you didn't do what Christ did on the cross. cross did, Jesus didn't get goaded into making a mistake, into hurting the name of Christ. No, you deal with it the right way. You go to the right people, you say, hey, I have these concerns, and even if you don't have the victory, are you trusting in God? See, that's the thing. You need to spend a lot more time on your knees. There are right ways to stand for those things and say those things are wrong, they're not okay. But we don't act like the rest of the world. Let them do the threats. Let them bomb the centers. Let them do those things. Let their actions speak to who their master is. And let our actions speak to who our master is. See, endurance. And please understand, you are suffering and it's hard. And that's the whole point. I would have to imagine for Jesus this wasn't an easy thing. Person after person making an insult. And you're powerful enough to just put an end to it right there. And yet he chooses not to. 
Because his love for even the people who are doing it is so great. The next part of God's plan we need to stick to is of extending grace. See, God's plan of grace grants time for repentance. As I mentioned briefly, if we go to 2 Peter 3... So 2 Peter 3, seven. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved in the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. God is standing back and he is taking notes. And to him it's not really that long. And part of taking notes is he's in that time period is he's giving people time to repent. And praise God that he does because that's your only hope. He'll take care of the bad dudes when it's time to take care of the bad dudes. You don't need to worry about that. Because that's where faith comes in. Do you believe that God will take care of those problems when He will and that those bad dudes actually, you know what? I'm glad that God is giving them time to repent. Because if we go back now and we see something incredible... I think, when we look at the thief on the cross. But the other rebuked him. So you got the two thieves, you got Jesus in the middle, you got one going after Christ, but you got the other one who rebukes the far one saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. The thief saw something. He says, Jesus did nothing to deserve to be here. I am guilty. And we see really the first step in repentance, don't we? I am guilty. Jesus is not. He should not be here. If anybody has a right to be ticked off and angry out of the three of us who are hanging here literally naked and bleeding and dying, it is him, and he's not. Who do you think you are? And then notice this. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What? on a cross. He is going to die. What kingdom is this guy talking about? Faith is that ability to see the things that you can't see from with human eyes. That thief looked at Christ and he said, he has to be who he says he is. When he dies, God, like, you realize it, through this entire story, the only person who gets it at this point until Jesus is risen from the dead is the thief. He's the only one who seems to get what's going on. I'm not saying he understands fully the whole resurrection thing, but he certainly sees that Jesus is God, he's king, and he's the ruler, and he is going to rule. That he is the God of the universe. You look at that and you say, how could he ever draw that conclusion? 
even if he rebukes the other guy for being a jerk, it still doesn't make any sense to look at that situation from his perspective and say that, yes, this guy is my only hope for salvation. Literally, he's the only guy in our story that gets it. And one can't help but wonder if part of the reason Jesus endures all this is just for that one man on the cross. God granted him the ability to see something that we could not see, that is as real as what you can see. That is amazing. But yet look what has come out of Christ's death on the cross. All of you here today, all the churches gathered throughout the world today. That thief, though probably not able to comprehend it, saw all of that. But he probably saw beyond that to that great day. Not understanding how we would even get there, but knowing that this man on this cross was not like any other. And he was the Son of God. And we will see that later. But we see that what happens, Jesus in 43, and he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And that is Christ extending grace as he dies on the cross. This, the next verses, we're going to go into that next week. Think about that. On the cross, Jesus extends grace in his suffering. And so that's what we're called to do too. We all suffer. But can we extend grace to others like Christ in our suffering? And you know, the interesting thing here is we see a purpose in all this. First one is the idea of forgiveness. First off, how that helps us grow in the faith. Two, who, two, second, how that can lead others to faith, which is the goal. We see endurance, right? And suffering produces endurance. And however much we may not like to suffer, endurance is a good thing. People train their bodies so that they can endure. And so we, as people, grow in our endurance through suffering. So that's another purpose of suffering. And then suffering is also an opportunity for us to show God's grace. And it doesn't matter what the suffering is. We're not just, we have the example of Christ where it's unjust suffering, but we can show grace in all suffering, can't we? We can suffer well and lead other people to Christ in no matter the kind of suffering that we endure. So these principles apply to all suffering. All degrees of suffering, right? Because we all suffer. Not every kind of suffering is the same, but we all suffer. And then I leave you with that idea of faith. That ability to see what doesn't make sense, but it's real and it's true. And see, that's where faith comes in. How can you hold to this plan? Faith. That God will bring about what He says He'll bring about. And you take confidence in that, even though to everybody else, you look like a crazy person. And just understand, if you're following Jesus, there's going to be times in your life where people are going to think you're crazy. And that's a good thing. So if people think you're crazy for the things you do following Jesus, good. You're on that right path. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the cross.